you. Well, this is a very special day. We're celebrating International Sabbath or the diversity of Wellspring. For those of you who are wearing your finest garb, whether it be your native costume or something else, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, after worship, immediately after worship, we were all going to go outside so we can take pictures, so we can remember this day. Anyway, we um, have some announcements very quickly. Um, today, our speaker today is Matthew Kerner, one of our elders. Title is The Glory of God. And this month is going to be a very busy month. Today, we celebrate um, International Sabbath. Next week, we will order, honor the graduates. And on the 17th, we will celebrate Father's Day. And on the 24th, we have communion. We have a special guest on the 24th. Um, Dr. Norma Flores is the science teacher. And we have our elders speaking for this month. Uh, we will honor our two graduates next week. Um, Raiden, who finished his uh, eighth grade, and Eliza, who completed her senior year in high school. If, if I missed anybody, please let me know today so we can include you in honoring you next year. I mean, next week. If you graduated from, maybe you graduated from uh, college or high school or um, elementary, middle school or kindergarten or preschool, we will still honor you. Next week is our game afternoon. Be here. We're going to uh, create special um, crafts for our fathers. We'll be uh, to in, in line or um, in time for our celebration of Father's Day. If you have not attended um, Barbara and Sue's activity, Second Sabbath, you're missing a lot. So be here next week in the afternoon. We continue with adult Sabbath school. Um, three cosmic messages, and this would be the last month. This is the 10th Sabbath. All right, uh, a copy, I don't think a copy is available anymore for this quarter, but we have copies available for next quarter. You can contact AJ if you need a copy. We have Eliza here, are the juniors and our early teens. Eliza is in charge. If you need, uh, here's the Zoom and the passcode. If you need um, a copy or if you need a link to the lesson study, uh, contact Eliza Pangilinan. She's in charge of the um, juniors and early teens. We also have our usual uh, little kids, learn about God's love is the theme. And um, if you want primary lessons as well for next quarter, let Renee know or Alexandra to, to get a copy or at least the link. A lot of you are using uh, online for studies and I find it very easy. It's like a punch, punch, punch with the finger and you've got all the text and all the uh, Mrs. Wise quotes and all the readings. It's really um, uh, very easy. You just have to be able to read. Prayer meeting every Wednesday, we invite you to attend. Our, our, um, I, our uh, Zoom ID did not change and the passcode is still the same. If you want Florence to text you, the uh, Zoom uh, ID and passcode, call her at 408-891-0531 or call, talk to her today. Our tithes and offerings go in the well at the back and or you can also um, return your tithes and offerings online at wellspringsda.org and you will be led to a um, the windows as to how to get to the donation window. If you find it in yourself to support the ministry of Wellspring, you could certainly use some funds in the Sabbath school and in the men's ministry and local budget. June 24, that's the last Sabbath, is our next distribution of our um, great controversy. Renee, do you want to add? Or Okay, how many more boxes do I, I think there are about four? There are about four boxes left, so that's really hardly anything. So I hope you all join June 24th in the afternoon. 
Mountain View Academy graduation weekend is going on right now. You, uh, it's too late for you to attend the baccalaureate, and, I'm, and thank you for spending the Sabbath with us instead. But their commencement is tomorrow at 10 a.m. at the um, Campbell. Uh, um. No, there's a name for it. Huh? Yeah, the Heritage Theater on Campbell. And SoCal, praise the Lord. SoCal is returning, not just online, but actually at the SoCal campgrounds. A lot of activities going on. On the 7th to 8th is the prayer ministry and, and the prayer um, session. And um, SoCal meeting starts the Thursday, July 13th, and will end July 22. Please go to the online, uh, to the website, uh, cccadventist.org slash camp meeting to see if you can still reserve. I'm not sure exactly what are available at this time because after three years of uh, recess from the pandemic, so now we're starting again, but it'll be here. Uh, at the board meeting tomorrow night, we will also decide if you want to close Wellspring for those two Sabbaths. Okay, it's now time. This is the project of the um, women's ministry and the children's ministry that we pray for a family every week, the whole week. And this week, we will be praying for Lynn Chan and the family. We haven't seen them in a while, so we really need to uh, pray for them. Sometimes the ladies, the girls come, and, but they need our prayers. At this time, we will hear a piano prelude by Adjulin. <laughs>
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a glorious Sabbath you've given us. Help us to keep our minds in tune with heaven above. Help us, Lord, remember who we are, and we are none other than your sons and daughters. And this morning, Lord, we invite your presence to join us as we worship you. And may the worship be from our hearts as we raise our voices in songs, our fingers in music. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. sa wikang Tagalog ng may kagalakan. Ang kawalhatian sa Diyos ibigay siya'y gumawa ng dakilang bagay anak isinubo na siyang
acompañar la hermana de, um, Dorothy, pero vamos a cantar en español. Adiós a la gloria. wonderful. Amen. I want to thank um, Florence, Alexandra, and all those who provided the lyrics <laughs> to the other languages. We were, wanted to sing it in Vietnam too, but we're not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> This presentation is interactive. I want you to help me by guessing certain uh, things. It's amazing how in this uh, tiny little church of Wellspring in this corner of Milpitos, we have numerous ancestry from different countries of origins. So uh, Wellspring was originally um, organized by 11 families from the San Jose Phil Am Church. So it's only um, 
it's, it, it's only uh, apparent that most of us are Filipinos. And we all came, of course, our, our, our origins in the Philippines, except a certain generation who are just solis, American. In other words, they were born here, but just sanguini, by blood, they are Filipinos. So there's no pure Filipino, actually, unless you're an Ita from the mountains, or a Mangyan, or a Moro in the southern part. We were all tainted by Spain during the colonization and by the business traders of China. The Philippines has 7,100 islands. That's what I learned when I was in, in grade school. But with the global warming, certain islands are coming up. Last number was 7,437 islands. Of course, not all are inhabited. Uh, divided by eight regions and three uh, big islands. Just by show of hands, how many of you are from the very northern <coughs> island in the very north of the North Island? Raise your hand. There you go. How many of you are from the central part of the North Island or Manila or Makati? That's me and Eric. <laughs> how many of you are from the southern part of the northern islands, the Bicol region? See, we have quite a few. I know we have quite a few. That's why I focus on that. How many of you are from the central islands, the blue color? No, I know Linda is from Rumblon. Oh, there you go, George. George, you're Ilocano. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are from the southern part, the pink, uh, in Mindanao? All right, I know most of us are from the north. All right. <laughs> The rest of us, or most of us, claim the USA to be our um, country, but not necessarily our roots. There is no such thing as a pure American either, unless you're a Native American. And there are only like about maybe 5% of them left pure Native Americans. Some of us are um, most of us, some of us are, um, na um, well, not some of us, the real Americans are those in the na uh, Native Americans. And I do know we have one person who is from, uh, whose roots are in the Choctaw uh, tribe. Can you guess? Barbara. <laughs> most of us are from California. And Big Mike claims to be pure Californian, and so does Andres. Now, uh, when we, well, spring was organized, we came with uh, some of the uh, Caucasian husbands. Guess who came from Michigan? David. Oh, you know, David is from Michigan. And guess who came from, who claims Hawaii as one of his roots? Look around. Our Caucasian friends who claim Hawaii is real. No, can you guess? Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> and then we have, we have members who are just sanguini by blood, Filipino, but just solis by birth, it's American. Can you guess who among our Filipino um, members born in Ohio? No, Filipino, but born in Ohio. Who, Matt? My wife, Renee. Yes, Renee was born in Ohio. <laughs> she was not born in the Philippines. And then we were joined eventually by Elena and her family. They are from Saigon City in Vietnam. We were also joined by Lynn and her family, and they are from Cambodia. And then, after, um, after several transfers and baptisms, we are joined by somebody from Arizona who claims Arizona as her roots. That's your cue, her roots. <laughs> but she's actually, can you guess who? Oh, she raised her hand. <laughs> can you guess who? You can't, don't have to guess anymore. 
Dorothy claims uh, Arizona <coughs> to be her roots. And then we were joined also by somebody from South America, from Ecuador. Wow. Can you guess? Oh, that was easy. <laughs> All right. Sandra, um, I just have to mention the huge cathedral there in Quito. She's from the city of Quito. And did you know that the Galapagos Islands part of Ecuador? So lots of history. In history. Then we have another one who claims her roots to be in Norway. <laughs> that was easy. She's the only one left. <laughs> but her ancestors moved to uh, Minnesota, so she claims also Minnesota as her state of origin. There's one more who claims Wales to be her roots of origin. There's one more left. She's not a member yet, but we're trying to get claw her in. Can you guess who? She's been very, very active. Barbara. All right. Barbara, oh, her mother actually, is, and her aunt, they're here. Bonnie, and they claim uh, Wales to be part of their ancestry. Here's another one, another, uh, and you can repeat, just uh, repeat uh, now, who claims Germany to be part of their ancestry. Can you guess? Matthew. Matthew and also Barbara. But, you know, let's cancel all this because we know our original roots is the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. I refuse to accept that I came from an amoeba or a monkey. I came <laughs> from God's creation through Adam and Eve. And someday, we'll look forward to his coming so we can inherit his island. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called, Where Are the Nine? The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 103, verses 2 and 3. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Today's message is we worship God when we thank Him. Have you ever had the chicken pox? I have. If so, you probably had to stay home from school for a long while. If you had gone to school, some other children might have caught the disease from you. That's because chicken pox is contagious. People can easily catch it. In today's lesson, we learn about 10 men who had a contagious disease. One day, Jesus and the disciples were walking to Jerusalem. They traveled a road on the border between Galilee and Samaria. Just as they were entering a village, 10 men called out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus looked around. He saw the lepers' shacks built outside the village. He saw men dressed in ragged clothing. He saw bandages wound around their feet and hands. And instantly, Jesus knew that these men were lepers. Jesus felt very sad when he saw the lepers. He knew how much they wanted to be well again. Long before Jesus lived on the earth, Moses had given some rules about leprosy. When the first sores of leprosy appeared on a leper's skin, he or she had to show them to the priest. 
the priest would look very closely at the sores and then send the person away. After a set amount of time, the person would return to the priest. If the sores had not healed, the priest would say that the person was unclean because he or she had leprosy. Lepers had to live outside of the village. They were not allowed to return to their families unless their sores healed. And though the lepers hoped and hoped, leprosy did not heal. Nine of these lepers were Jews, and one was a Samaritan. They had heard of Jesus. They held out their arms to Jesus and begged him to help them. Go show yourselves to the priest, Jesus called. For just a moment, the lepers may have been disappointed. But then they understood. They knew why Jesus was sending them to the priest. The lepers knew they would have to show themselves to a priest. If the priest said that they were healed, everyone else would welcome them back into the village. They could go home and live with their families again. What are we waiting for? They probably asked as they hurried to find the priest. As they ran, the feeling returned to their feet and their hands. The sores went away. They were truly healed. As much as the Samaritan wanted to reach the priest with the others, he stopped. He turned around and ran back to Jesus. Praising and thanking God, the man fell at Jesus' feet. Thank you, he may have whispered, and then louder, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus' eyes sparkled. So few people he had helped were truly thankful. He looked down the road at the nine Jews hurrying on their way. Were there not ten lepers cleansed? Jesus sadly asked. Where are the other nine? Is the Samaritan the only one who will thank and praise God? Then Jesus turned to the Samaritan and said, Get up and go. Because of your great faith, you have been made well. Joy filled the man's heart, and with a thankful heart, he worshipped God. Created and produced by Falvo Fowler. This podcast is read by Franita Buddy Fullwood for gracelink.net. Animation and artwork by Giogo Godoy. Audio is post-produced by Faith Toe at Studio El Piso in Singapore. The theme music is by Clayton Kinney. The audio engineer was Maurice Bailey. Once again, thank you for these children. We ask you, Lord, to help each one of them to know your word and grow in faith each day. We ask that you would remind these children of how much you love them. We pray that they find security and confidence fully in you. Please keep them safe and protect their coming and going, and to remind them that you're always with them. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. children praying, Lord, send your spirit in this place, Lord, listen to your children praying, send us love, send us power, send us grace. 
children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And Fiend Dowie Dow. That's Norwegian for a fine day today. For those who are able, could you please kneel for the Garden of Prayer? Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts. Grateful for the food you provide us, our homes that shelter us, our families who love us. We are mostly grateful for your grace and your love, a love that is so big and so strong that you were willing to send your son Jesus to die for us. On this International Sabbath Day, help us to remember that although we come from many nations, tribes, and peoples, that we are all one blood and belong to one race, the human race that you, Father, have formed with your own hands and given life by your own breath. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, today's scripture reading is Psalms 19, 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, 
and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath morning, and thank you for these Bible verses, and please guide and bless Uncle Matt as he delivers your message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Please remain seated. <laughs> I didn't realize till I got here that I looked like cabin crew for American Airlines. <laughs> but since I'm American by birth and Californian by birth too, um, uh, um, I'm an American, I'm Californian. But as Raquel said, you know, um, Americans were a mix of everything and even when you um, go around the world, and you study the history of all the different races and cultures, um, what you have is um, no one is actually pure anything, really, if you go deep far enough back. And that's okay. And in fact, that's a good thing. Okay. So before I begin, let's go ahead and open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath morning. We want to thank you for this day. We Thank you for uh, the blessings you've given us, for the warm sunshine that you bestow upon us every single day, the unfailing light that we can expect every morning. You have been so consistent, not just with that, but with all the other blessings. Uh, may your, I pray for the Holy Spirit on me so that as this sermon progresses, that glory will be given to you in all things and in all ways. I pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen. Okay. So yes, I'm an American, and, um, but I also have Hawaiian heritage. So the only thing you probably know about me that's Hawaiian is my surfing. <laughs> my Hawaiian surfing blood. Um, but yeah, in Hawaii, I actually have a lot of relatives, second cousins. And um, my mom was over there uh, probably about a year or so ago to f look at some property that my uh, relatives had uh, decades ago beachfront property that was taken by the Hawaiian government to be used in preservation. And she found some people that remember the Kellys. They were the most, so the Hawaiian answer she was based Hawaiian and Irish. And so they loved to fight, if you know the fighting Irish. So they were notorious across the Hawaiian islands as the Kellys, the fighting Kellys, the fighting Irish. But that was mixed with German and Czech and um, uh, some more Irish, and here I am today. But you know, no one should be ashamed of who they are. No one should be ashamed of their heritage. I know it's, race is a massively huge issue right now. And it is really sad, you know, that uh, the diversity that God has created, the potential that he gave the human race it's been hijacked by Satan, and it's pinned us against each other. So that at this point, we no longer reflect the true glory of what God had originally intended us to be. So what is it that makes us who we are, at least, you know, from a worldly standpoint? Language, border, and culture. Those are the three things that pretty much you would define a person by. So Philippines, they have a border. They're an island. Their border's the ocean. Their language, the main one, is Tagalog. Then you have all the other dialects, Ilocano, Visayan. Um, what was that? Papangan. Papangan? <laughs> Ka Papangan. Um, there's, what, 70 plus? 92 plus dialects. And I can only speak a couple words of Ilocano. It's before noon, so Naimbag Nabigat. So yeah, you, and your language is a big defining factor on your identity and your culture. 
And so I grew up in Redding, California, which in the 80s and 90s was fairly homogenous. And it wasn't too diverse in culture. Um, but it wasn't until I came down to the Bay Area did I really have a wonderful experience and my eyes were opened about you know, such diversity. Because I lived in Sunnyvale, so I learned a lot about the East Indian culture, festivals like the Vali Mila. Um, I love all the different foods that we have down here. I know my wife and I, we were in Indiana uh, just last week. And if you wanted to get Thai food, we'd have to drive 40 minutes. Here, there's like four restaurants within a mile from the house. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yes. So living in the Bay Area, it's expensive, but you know, there's definitely nice benefits that it offers. And one of them that I like is the diversity. And so I got to be familiar with a lot of different um, you know, cultures, languages, and people, and it really opened my mind to um, the world, which I love to travel. And in 2007, Glenn and Florence, they invited me to go on one of their mission trips in Philippines. And I had never been outside the United States. And it was one of the most eye-opening experiences you could ever have, being raised in a first world country and then visiting a third world country, which functions, it was completely different than what I was used to in America. Granted, yes, it's hot, it's humid, the, um, the air is really smoggy, but it really blew my mind when I realized I wasn't in Kansas anymore, using the Wizard of Oz reference, was when um, we were going through customs. And you got the little customs paper, you know, are you carrying food, are you carrying money, are you carrying this, this, that? Florence told me, check no on everything. <laughs> She'd given me a Balik Bayon box, and she said, no on everything. And I was like, uh, okay, that's um, weird. That's not good. <laughs> then we go through customs. And as we got all these boxes, we're going through me and Glenn. Florence goes up to the custom agents and points to us. I don't know what she's saying. <laughs> then she, but we call it a tip, right? You tip the custom agent. She gives the custom agent a tip in American dollars. And I'm just like, we're so dead. <laughs> you, you don't do that. that that's, that's not how things work. You know, you're going to go to jail. You're going to get in trouble. And so as he passed by it, he's not even looking at the uh, custom slip. And then he's got a stack of cash, euros, dollars, pesos. And it's at that point I realized, well, this is going to be quite the experience. And the Philippines was a very welcoming country. I had a great time. Been back three more times after that. Lived there for two months and married a Filipina. Who I didn't, from Ohio. <laughs> uh, language, borders, and culture. So as I was listening to Raquel, she took a third of my sermon. So we can go ahead and I will breeze through that. But yeah, the language, borders, and culture, which stemmed from, you know, the Tower of Babel when God confused languages and people were forced to separate, that's when you really had definitive different races because it was separated by language, which gave birth to a different culture, which gave birth to borders. And so when we go back and we look at the Bible, we are all of what race? The human race, which is ultimately run one race, but God being a God of diversity, he gave Adam and Eve the genetic potential for whether you want to call it Variation, which would be classified as microevolution. So you have two evolutions. You got macroevolution, which a amoeba becomes a human, which we don't believe in, but microevolution refers to the variation within the same species. So you got the human race, it's a species. We have people, you know, that have Europeans, we have longer nose bridge. Asians, it's more of a flat. <laughs> yes. And then the eyes, you know, Europeans are more wider. Asians tend to be more um, cheeky. Chinky is, is, can I say that? <laughs> hey, they said it, not me. They, they told me to say it. <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely differences, and that's, that's in the DNA and the genetic code that God has given us, the human race, for the potential to, to diversify, to show the difference, how different God really is. 
Because if you look in the Bible, what, what does God look like? What do you think he looks like? Okay, so yeah, we were made in Genesis chapter 2. We were made in the image of God. So that means God has to have two hands, you know, two arms, legs, head, torso, uh, just like we do. So we, we can make that assumption because the Bible says we were made in his image, so we reflect God. But what I want to talk about today, focus on, is God's glory. Now, what does God's glory look like? Well, if we turn our Bibles to, we're going to start with Exodus chapter 33. So if you want to turn with me, go to Exodus chapter 33. This is right after the uh, children of Israel, they had left um, Egypt and they had just worshipped the golden calf. And Moses comes down, and he's very angry. He burns the calf, turns it into powder, puts it in the water, makes him drink it. And then 3,000 people are killed for their sins because if you don't nip it in the bud, they would infest and infect the Israelites down the road. So this is after all that happens. So it's a very solemn time for the Israelites. And it's a very, um, I would say, stressful time for Moses because after that he goes back up to the mountain and he's talking with God, and God wants to wipe them out. I mean, everything God did for them, he, he rescued them from slavery. He performed all these miracles. He parted the Red Sea so they could get through. He wiped out most of the Egyptian army. Uh, you had the plagues that affected the Egyptians, but not the uh, children of Israel. So, I mean, with all these blessings, with all the goodness God had showed them, what do they do literally in the weeks and months following their freedom. They turn their back on him, and they go back to their old ways, to worshiping idols. So, yes, you don't want to make God angry. But it is a good thing they had Moses, because Moses interceded for them. And as you pick this up in uh, Exodus chapter 33, verse 12, this is Moses having a conversation with God. It's one of the few people that could get as close to the presence of God as anyone could. Even Moses could not see all of God, and we'll find out as we read on. Starting in verse 12, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray if I have found grace. So Moses is saying, Now Therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. So Moses is asking for basically a sign from God, let me know that we are still in your grace, that you're not going to destroy us. And continuing on in 15, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us, so we shall be separate, so so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth? So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So God is going to go with them as they travel across the desert. But Moses also adds something else to this in verse 18. He says, and he said, please show me your glory. And every time I read this, I think about the movie A Few Good Men. And Jack Nicholson, see when he says the truth, you can't handle the truth. Well, it's the same with God's glory. You want to see my glory? You cannot handle all of my glory because you are a, uh, you are, you have fallen from grace. And it continues on in 19. Then he said, I will make all my goodness go before you. So we equate God's glory with what? Goodness. So glory is goodness. Now, glory can refer to a couple different things depending on how you want to use it. So give glory to God. God is glorious. It can be used any number of of ways. But here, Moses wants to see God's glory. And so then he said, I will make all my goodness or my glory pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. 
And when you just dwell on that, that's really mind-blowing. I mean, it's just, you have God, and if you just look at him in his full glory, you will die. Well, what's the mechanism of action in which, you know, if you look on God and you die? I mean, is it just so bright like the sun? You get too close to the sun and you die because of the heat? Not quite. So it was explained to me, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. The glory of God is his goodness, and God is ultra good. I mean, he is the top. You don't get higher than that in goodness. And we are not good. So if you think about if you ever wrong someone, like you break, uh, when you're a kid, you throw a baseball through your neighbor's window. You go up and you say, you know, I'm with your head down, I'm, I'm sorry, you know. You look him in the eyes, you know, it's very difficult on you, right? Well, imagine looking into the eyes of God, the goodness of God, and every sin you ever committed comes back all at once. Everything you ever did, every wrong you did to anyone, every law you ever broke, comes back and the guilt of that weighs on you at the same time. What's going to happen? Your physical body, your mental health cannot deal with it and you will utterly die. Your body cannot handle such goodness when you are so not good. Does that make sense? And so that's God's glory, God's goodness. If you saw God for all the goodness he is and for all the bad things and compare that to the bad things you did, you would want the rocks to fall on you. You could, when Saul, on his way to Tarshish, when he, uh, God paid him a visit and said, why do you persecute me? What happened to Saul? He became blind. He fell down to the ground. He could not stand in the presence of God. Because at that point, he realized what he did wrong, and he was so remorseful and so sorry for it that he just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and, you know, God forgave him, and we know the story of Saul. He became Paul and one of the greatest missionaries that the Christian church has, has ever had. But that is to understand, basic understanding of why we cannot see God's glory in its fullness. Now, Moses was able to see his backside, which, as we all know, the backside is not very interesting, right? <laughs> no one wants to see my back while I speak to you. <laughs> but that's all Moses could handle was the boring backside of God, which, from his point of view, which I would probably say is very interesting. So, we know that God has glory, God has goodness, and we're not worthy of seeing God's glory, and God wants to show us all his goodness. In fact, when he created us, it says here in um, Isaiah 43, chapter 7, that we were made for his glory, which means when, in Genesis 2, when God made Adam, when God made Eve, he made them to reflect his glory, to reflect his goodness. And from that point on, they were supposed to be fruitful, multiply, and as the human race were to expand, as it were to become more diverse, all of it would show God's glory. It would reflect, reflect God's glory, and then, you know, you would have a better image of who God is. Now, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting statement here, and this is found in, what is it, Isaiah? No, it's, wait a second. But it describes the glory of God. It gives a description of it, and I think it's in Isaiah... Ezekiel. Oh, that's uh, Ezekiel chapter one verse twenty six. So you want to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter one twenty six. This is a vision that Ezekiel had of God. So God gave Ezekiel a vision of what He looks like, and the verse starts out with an understanding of how God works, of how God is holding up. Everything, he's holding up the universe, he's holding up the sun, he's holding up the moon, the stars, holding us up, and there's these wheels that are spinning, and there's wheels inside of wheels, gears, and it's very confusing, but everything is in perfect sync, meaning that God is in control of everything that is going on in his universe. He has control of everything, even though if you turn on the news, it looks like everything's out of control, right? But God has... God has to let certain things happen to allow his free to allow our free will 
to um, progress because he made us creatures that have a choice, a choice to do good or do bad, to serve others or serve self. That is ultimately the bottom line why God gave us free will was so we could serve others. But, and that's what he wants us to do, but that free will, you also have to give the person the free will to not serve others. That, that's just the nature of the system. That's the nature of, of love in the situation. God is a God of love. Can you force someone to love you? No, try. Try forcing someone to love you. How well does that work? It's not love anymore. You can call it something else, but don't call it love. And so for love to truly function, it has to be freely given. And so that's why Satan made the choice to serve self. That's why Eve made the choice to eat the fruit and made the choice to give Adam the fruit, which doomed the human race. But going up to Ezekiel 1, chapter 26, this describes uh, what God's glory would look like. Now, Moses did not tell us what God's glory looked like. He just saw the backside of it. But Ezekiel gives us uh, somewhat of an overview on what human eyes are able to comprehend in the glory of God. So in verse 26, and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Its appearance like a sapphire stone on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw as it were the color of amber. Now there are pastors and people that have said, oh, the color of amber, that means God is brown. Like somehow that's going to give you some sort of advantage. It doesn't because, you know, God treats us all the same. God's grace is for every single person. And just because God might, God's skin color might be closer to yours gives you no advantage for salvation. It gives you no advantage for anything. But some people in pastors would want to use this to say, to further an earthly agenda. Honestly, I don't think it really matters, and God still loves you no matter what you look like. The color of amber, with the appearance of fire all around within it, and from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow, remember that rainbow, in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So God's appearance is diverse in its look. The rainbow is one of the most diverse, you know, items, you know. When it comes to diversity, it shows all the different colors, all the colors of the spectrum. And there have been groups that have taken it to represent their diversity. Well, God also has his diversity as well. And his glory encompasses it all, which means every single nationality on the planet, every single one of us, we were made to reflect God's glory. So the human race, as it stands in all its different colors, should reflect the glory of God. But what has happened to this uh, planet? We know sin came in. And if you want to keep, uh, keep a population from overthrowing you, so if you're the ruler, if you're the dictator, what do you have to do to keep a population from overthrowing you? Because the ruling party is less, usually less than 1% of the governed population. So by sheer numbers, you're not going to survive if there's an overthrow, if there's a rebellion. So what do you have to do? Well, you don't... Well, if, if, you, if you had a plantation and you own slaves, you wouldn't want to kill them because you know you need them to work for you. So you don't want to kill them. But this was, this was very common, you know, in the South on the plantations is you kept them separated. You actually turned them against each other so they could not mm. unite against the land order, unite against the master. And that was one of the methods they used to um, keep control over the slaves at the time, over the people they... Uh, they governed, and that is what Satan uses to, it, they pin us against each other so that we're too busy fighting each other, hating each other, being angry about what someone else does, that we can't focus on God, focus on his glory, and what Jesus Christ has done for us to overthrow the influence of Satan. And so that's, what's, that's what 
this, I mean, Satan, if we look at the what's going on in the world, the events, I'm not going to. Everyone knows what's going on. I'm not going to try to push any one side or other agenda. I just want to um, let the world know about God's agenda, God's agenda for redemption to redeem the human race so that we reflect the glory that he had originally intended us for. But what the devil has done over, the, over millennia is he's kept us separated. He wants to make sure that we do not reflect the glory of God. He wants to demoralize us. In fact, if you want to take over a population, if you want to take over a country, um, there's a, there's a four-step process in which you have to do it. Now, do you remember a guy named Yuri Bezmenov? I showed a video of him up here. He was a KGB defector, and it was his job to brainwash people, to convince people to love the Soviet style of communism because communism is so much better than capitalism. Do you see that today, an agenda being pushed? And so one of the things is, is you have to demoralize a nation, which means you have to, um, basically, you have to destroy the system of law and order, and you have to destroy its moral values and principle. You have to, in many ways, destroy its culture if you want to take it over, because the culture defines it. In America, we have, our culture is, uh, is founded on basically European Protestantism, which is why we have a document called the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, which was very radical in its day. Because in England, you had the lords, you had the landowners, and you had serfs. And basically, if you were a serf, there is no way you could ever own property or land in England because all the land is accounted for. You'd have to be rich to buy property from someone. But in America, there is this vast expanse of open land, and everyone came to it because they wanted the chance for a better life. They wanted land. They wanted to live according to their dictates. And because of religious persecution, a lot of the Protestants, you know, the early Quakers, they came over and they established, they established their little uh, settlements, their towns, eventually became colonies. But those principles were founded on Judeo-Christian values. And that is ultimately what is under attack right now. Now, we see it as, as race. You know, it's whites versus black. It's Mexicans versus, um, what? You got, you got all the gangs, you know, Asians, um, um, all of it. But ultimately, when you really study it and you study the Bible and you understand Ephesians 6.10 where, you know, we're fighting principalities, we're fighting the devil, it's God versus Satan, you will see that what's going on is you have a communist Marxist overthrow of Protestant Christianity disguised as a civil rights movement. Just if you, if you don't agree with me, just think of, keep that in the back of your head. And as you watch news, as you see what goes on in the world, it, it will make more sense. So a uh, communist Marxist overthrow of Protestant Christianity disguised as a civil rights movement. Because anything white is racist, right? Get that in the back of your head. It will, it will become apparent what is going on. So where do we go from here? Well, we know in the book of Revelation that things are going to get worse. So are things, are relations in the world going to get better? Is Russia going to uh, surrender in Ukraine and just withdraw and we're going to have peace and all live happy, happily ever after? No. You know why? Because there's very powerful people influenced by the devil that do not want peace. They want their own world order. And this is something that's been going on for thousands of years. The Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persians, Greece, the Roman, the Roman Empire, all the different uh, countries in Europe, Middle East, they've been at war with each other for millennia. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of people that want peace, peace, peace. It's not going to happen. The only peace you can get is through peace with Jesus Christ. That is going to be the true peace. It doesn't matter how many, 
how many G20s or how many uh, world organizations you form to try to, you know, control the world, control peace, get a grip on this, this whole climate change, which um, I have a different opinion about. But if you think about it, well, just, just think about it and look at the agenda. Look at the narrative that you're being fed on it. And just read the Bible and just think about it. And you're going to see that there are some things that just don't add up about it. And if you really want to know what the whole agenda is, read the Pope's climate encyclical, Laudato Si. Now, I did a couple sermons about this, and it's on the, uh, in our archives on our YouTube channel. But definitely, if you want to know, truly understand what the end game is, read Laudato Si, written by the Pope. That will give you a, a great insight into it. But where do we go from here? Well, this is, I want to talk about something. So this is a map of the world. Did you know that uh, Africa is bigger than the United States, even though it doesn't look like this? Do you know why? Because the Earth is round. And what they've done is they've taken a round image and they flattened it. So whatever is in the middle is going <coughs> to shrink to be smaller to accommodate. So Africa is actually quite a lot more bigger than the United States. Just a little tidbit there. <coughs> what I'm going to show you next, a lot of you are probably familiar with, but this is something I learned in first grade that I was taught. Everyone ever heard of Pangea? Okay, who can tell me what Pangea is? No one? Okay, so Pangea is a supercontinent. And I truly believe that this is what the earth looked like when God created it. Because if you think about it, why would he create something here that's three, 4,000 miles away from here, there, and no way to get there? Did he want Adam and Eve to swim across the Atlantic Ocean to get to the United States or to get to what we call North America? They probably could have. But, you know, Revelation 21.1 talks about the new heaven and the new earth, and it says that there's no sea. So what does that mean? Does that mean that there's not going to be any sharks, whales, dolphins, walruses in the new earth? There will be. So where will they be? In the water. In the water. But, what, but a lot of theologians and a lot of people would agree on is that there won't be any more vast expanse of water separating us. You won't have the Atlantic Ocean, you won't have the Indian Ocean or the Pacific separating the different races of people. It's going to be one landmass. And so Pangea, there's a lot of evidence to support that the Earth actually was that one point. And so evolutionists, they'll jump on this because utilizing um, plate tectonics, where the Earth crust moves a couple inches a year, if you're talking about a time period of 200 million years, you could easily move continents 2,000 miles apart. But we are not evolutionists. We believe in a 6,000, that the Earth is 6,000 years old and there's a creation. So what would cause this to happen? But before I get to that, I just want to go over some evidence that has come to, um, that supports this idea that the continents used to be one giant supercontinent. So you have the, um, so post-World War II, when they started mapping the bottom of the ocean, they found out that there were similarities between, between the ocean bottoms of the, uh, the war of the ocean. And so if you look at Brazil and Africa, don't they look like they fit together? And if you get to the United States, doesn't this look like it should go here? And then just everything, just it seems like it would fit like a puzzle. Now, it's not a perfect puzzle because you have erosion over thousands of years of the shore and all that. But when you look at, but it was, um, who was it? There's a couple people here. And one of the big guys was Abraham Ortelius in 1596. So Pangea is a very old idea. It's not something too new. But because of limited technology, they were not able to gather the information needed to, um, you know, as they study this more and more, they found more evidence to support 
Pangaea. And so what they found is, here, so additional evidence for Pangaea is found in the geology, so in the rocks itself of adjacent continents, including geological trends between the eastern coast of South America and the west coast of Africa, the polar ice caps of Carboniferous from the Carboniferous period covered the southern end of Pangaea. Glacial deposits, specifically teal of the same age and structure, are found on many separate continents that would have been together in the continent of Pangaea. So what it's saying is there are fossils, so you got fossils of ancient creatures and flowers that, and vegetation that have been found in Australia, Antarctica, India, and Africa, and South America. And so the pattern in which they found them would coincide as if you had these countries put together. Interesting, isn't it? And then you also got the ocean floor with the pattern in which the plate tectonics move is that it would match to where the, when you track, backtrack the origin, it comes in. So then if we don't believe in 200 million years of evolution, what could cause this? What event in the Bible could easily make this happen? The flood. One of the biggest cataclysmic events in the history of the world. Um, and when you study the flood, I mean, it's in the Bible, there's only about 11 verses that cover it. But it talks about the fountains of the deep opening up. Well, what's the fountains of the deep? It was most likely the water that was under the earth. And in Genesis 2, I think it's chapter 6, yeah, Genesis 2, chapter 6, it talks about the mist that would come up from the ground and water all the, all the vegetation and all that stuff. Prior to the flood, no one had ever seen rain. So the fountains of the deep, those were blown open, which means massive rocks, massive geological structures just broke open, which means the earth started to be deformed as all this stuff started coming up from underneath. And then you have all the rain that came down from the windows of heaven. Now, some people believe that it was an actually, there was a water coating over the earth, kind of like we have our atmosphere in the ozone. Well, <coughs> it's, when you really study it, it could be possible that all this water that came from the windows of heaven, where was it kept? I don't think there'd be enough clouds to keep enough of that to rain 40 days and 40 nights, but if you have a covering, a water covering over the entire earth, that would definitely help also protect against solar radiation. I mean, because, you know, we have, we have to worry about UVs and UV rays. If you have a, another coating of water along with the atmosphere, that's going to help block more radiation too. So that was also a protection that no longer exists. And so all that water that came down from the heavens all the water that came up from the top to flood the entire planet so there was no land whatsoever, where does that water go? So, so it rained 40 days, 40 nights. The water was on the earth for, is it 150 days? What was it? 150 days, water was on the planet, even though it only rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Where do you put all that water? Not enough. You would have to create a new reservoir for all this water that did not exist on the earth. It existed in the firmament and above, but it did not exist on the earth at creation. So where do you put it? I am pretty sure God, you know, he spread it apart, you know, to make a big filling to put all that water in. Think about it. I mean, nothing's impossible for God, right? And so thinking ahead in the future, the Tower of Babel, you know, if people stayed united, what would happen? They would, in a few couple of generations, they'd become like the antediluvian people, extremely wicked, and you'd have to wipe them out. So at Babel, he confounded the languages. They separated. They created different countries. They created their language, culture, and borders. And then also, instead of keeping them on the same continent, well, let's have them migrate to different ones to keep them separated. Interesting thought. So I think, so I believe that when the new heaven and new earth comes down, 
we're not going to have all these different continents. We're just going to have one super continent. And God's kingdom, the new Jerusalem, is going to be right smack dab in the center. And we're going to live there, and then we're going to fan out and populate the world. What a glorious day that will be. So how do we get there as an individual? I mean, we see the greatness of God. We've seen the diversity of God. We know the plan of redemption, how he wanted to redeem us to the original state. How do we get to the point where we can actually see the glory of God in all its glory? I mean, don't you want to see God in all his glory without dying? Well, until Jesus Christ returns again and we get our heavenly bodies, that's not going to be possible. But what do we do in the meantime? So this is from Ministry of Healing, page 464. It reads, It is sin that darkens our mind and dims our perceptions. As sin is purged from our hearts, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, illuminating his word and reflected from the face of nature, more and more fully will declare him merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So as you draw closer to God, as you let God's grace work in your life to help change bad habits, to help with addressing the sin issues that we all have in our lives. I mean, I don't want to stand up here and think I'm accusing people that you're all sinners because, well, you are, but I'm a sinner too, and there are things that I'm never going to tell anyone. So, um, But we are all children of God. We are all sinners, and God has given us a path forward, a way out. If you just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be showered with grace. And that grace, what the great God's grace does, again, can you, yeah? What God's grace does is, it's, there's a lot of pastors, and they'll say, oh, because you're under grace, you know you can pretty much live the life you ever want. No, that's not the case, you know. They call that greasy grace, you know. You're saved once, once saved, always saved, you're under grace. Go ahead and live your life. That's not how grace works. The idea of grace is to remove condemnation. So remember the woman caught in adultery. He said, who's here to condemn you? No one. Well, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. By removing the condemnation, that, give, that releases your conscience. You are free to go forward in life without worrying about the sins of the past, without worrying about the things you have done. Because if you were to move forward and you carry that baggage of sin from the past, that is going to inhibit you from moving forward to getting to refining yourself, to being able to get closer to the glory of God, to reflect God. So that's what God's grace do, does through Jesus Christ is it lifts the condemnation so you're free consciously without guilt to move forward to make better decisions for your life, to draw closer to God. And as you do that, you will see how great God really is. I mean, it's, you know, one reason why we don't think, why we lost, we lose sight of how great God is is because he's so consistent with his blessings. Do you feel blessed that the sun rises every morning and sets in the evening? Has it ever not happened from the beginning of creation? No, that's a blessing because if we don't have sunlight, within, within three, within the first week, we're going to lose 60% of the world's population to cold. Things are not going to function. Everything's going to die because it's just going to get so cold. But God is so full of blessings and he's so consistent with his blessings that we've gotten used to it and we don't understand. We've lost sight that it's a natural blessing. And you really don't realize how blessed you are until it's gone. You don't know how blessed you are to have sunlight unless it doesn't come up in the morning. You're blessed to have air to breathe and when you realize there's no air left, God's like, you know what? I'm taking the day off. You know, I just... I'm tired of these people, you know, I'm just walking away. He doesn't do that. He is there with you every day, blessing you with what you need. And if we can open our mind to the simple things, just, if you can do this, rejoice, because there's a lot of people that can't do that. There's a lot of people in wheelchairs. I know when I hurt my Achilles, 
I was in a boot, and I was, oh, I couldn't jump. I couldn't do much of anything. And so it's events like that that make you realize how blessed you really are when you can dance and jump and just get up out of bed and just walk you know, to the kitchen and get breakfast. That is a blessing. And if we just look at the simple things and realize how lucky we are, especially when it comes to the entire world, how blessed we are in America to have what we have. Because you could still be living in the province of Ilocos, you know, with a hole in the ground. I was shocked when I saw that. There are some people that just, in their house, they had a hole in the ground. And this is 2007. And this is out in the province in the countryside. I'm sure they've been developing it, so I'm sure it's different. But just the simple things, just give glory and praise to God in the simple things. And your life will be more you'll be happier, more fulfilling, and you'll understand what? Abundantly fulfilling. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath day. We want to thank you for the uh, blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We know um, uh, you've blessed us so much that we've lost sight of what a blessing truly is. So I pray that we will focus on you, that we will look to, um, look to you for all wisdom and guidance, and that we will be able to, uh, be able to show that, to show your grace, mercy to those around us, because this world is full of hatred, anger, and rage, and um, we know that the only, the only real peace we can have is a peace with you. So I pray that as we go forward, as we minister to people to reach out to them that we will have the patience we will have the uh, the courage that you have to present your love to them and show them how great and wonderful a relationship with you really is i pray for each person here i pray uh, as for everyone online and watching that as they go forward in life that they will not only look to you for wisdom and guidance but look to you in the simple things in life the simple things in nature because all the nature speaks of your glory. Everything on this planet that you made speaks of your glory. May we, um, may we give honor to you in all that we do. I pray and ask all this in the name of your son. Amen.
we come before you this uh, Sabbath uh, day. We want to thank you for everything you've done for us. We ask that you will uh, We pray for the food. We ask your blessing on it. And we thank you for the hands and the means that uh, people have to prepare it. We pray that as each person goes forward, that they will have a uh, different outlook on life and be able to look things in a, uh, in a new light, in your light. We pray all this in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen. Happy Amen. Sabbath. For you eat and get stained with food. <laughs> I'd like everybody, whether you're dressed or not, instead of outside, everybody come forward. As your church clerk, I would like to document this day. Mm -hmm.